Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last of our live Old Blue uh, talks of this series. Um, throughout today's talk, please feel free to pop any questions or comments you have in the Q&A box at the bottom, and we will get through as many of those as we can at the end. Uh, so coming live today from the National Museum of Computing, uh, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Paul Keller. Uh, Gina was saying, um, th this is the bomb gallery at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. Um, what we're going to try and show you today is how the bomb was designed, built and used to um, break the Enigma codes. So the first thing to do is to know your enemy. This is an, the Enigma at work. Notice that each time you push a key, a letter lights up to show the encrypted version of that letter and the wheels that you see at the back move on one square at a time so that each key is scrambled sorry excuse me each key stroke is scrambled through a different permutation of the wiring in those rotors now what's happening here is that an unseen hand is typing in the message of vetter for Herzaga, weather forecast, and the encrypted message is SNM, KG, G, and so on. A lot more detail about that will follow, but as I said, this is the enemy. You can see the wheels, you can see the um, plug board on the front, and basically that was the problem that this bomb, which we're going to look at in more detail, was invented to solve. Now, If we now move back into the, the, this is the main part of the gallery, and I will go in, in here. Right. This is the bomb. Let me tell you a little bit more about that before we start. It is a per perfect working replica, perfect in every detail, of one of the Turing Welchman bombs, of which 210, that's 210, were built during the war. It was hugely successful. I, nobody exactly knows how, how much it shortened the war and so on, but they were just a factory breaking the Enigma keys every day, and they were very, very good at it. Now, if we could have the next slide, please. Right, that is the list of complete Enigma keys for a whole month. For those of you who studied Greek rather than German when you had the chance, Geheim, nicht in Flugzeug mitnehmen, means secret, don't take it with you in the, airport, in the aircraft. And what you have here is starting at the bottom left, the first day of the month, you have across, you have got all of the settings of the Enigma. You've got the wheel orders. On the first, it was 415. Then Ringstellung, the next one, is slightly more complicated. I'll explain that in a moment. Then Steckerverbindungen, that's the plug board on the front of the Enigma, which was uh, added by the um, German army when they took over the commercial version of the Enigma. They thought it made it more secure, although, as you will see later, it didn't particularly. So the, the, the first thing to note is if you multiply all the possible permutations together you end up with a really unbelievably large number it's I, I, nobody is exactly sure how much it is it's something like 180 million 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 it, it's just unbelievably large but the first thing to learn is that that number is not actually terribly relevant most of us I think will have remember being taught, among others, by Mr. Armistead, about a million monkeys with a, typing for a million years on a million computers coming up with the works of Shakespeare. Now, that's true, obviously. Everything he taught us was true, but it's only half of the story. Because the problem you have with that kind of approach is that how do you know wh whether the two versions of Hamlet, one where he dies at the end and the other where he doesn't, which is the right version? You, you have no way of knowing that and you need a much more definitive approach to it. Now, um, let me show you for next the Turing's invention as to how you attack that. In headline terms, he understood that the way to do it was um, by 
guest text. So if we could have the slide that shows the intercepted message, right. This is a typical intercepted message now. Um, the first six letters are interesting, and we'll come back to them in more detail, but that is the encrypted message. That's all you've got to start with. There's, you get no other help at all, but what Turing understood is um, if you could perhaps pop up the next slide. Hello? Right. Um, yeah, that the technique that was going to work was based on uh, guest text. This chappy here, cast your mind back to the evening of D-Day 1944. Um, this chappy who sadly died, but we have his permission to use this. Um, he, note, you noted that, that the same day, that from the same place in the middle of the Bay of Biscay, an operator sent a, a, what was apparently the same message. Um, Veta Hair for Saga Biscaya, which again translates as the weather forecast for the Biscay area. Now, what Turing did was recognize that if you have the intercepted message we saw a moment ago and you have a pretty good idea as to what it is, then you can put together a process for breaking the code. Now, that sounds, I freely admit, sounds far fetched, but there are more cribs about than you realize. We all these days have mobile phones and they all send emails and they all have an automated signature sign off at, you know, sent from my iphone or you know sent from um, paul's mobile and that is a perfectly good known crib you know that if the message is from me then somewhere buried in it is that plain text the cribs are everywhere and people just don't realize it. We had some fun with GCHQ the other day when I pointed that out. They are all good. They all change their passwords every month as you're supposed or whatever. But they, when they realized that they'd been sending a perfect crib with all their messages for some time, there was what can only be described as a silence in the room. That was quite funny. But anyway, so back, back here then, we've now got the, what you, the message that you saw being uh, encrypted on the Enigma in the original film. Um, it, it was typing Veta for Herzaga, and what was coming out was S, N, M, K, G, and all the other stuff. So that's the intercept, and you can see um, there's the message across the top. You can also see that it um, starts in this imaginary position, Z, 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 as you saw earlier, each time you put the key, that the wheels move on one, Z, Z, A, Z, Z, B, and so on. So that is no more than the intercept in its correct position against the intercepted text. I will just digress for a second because you often hear that the Enigma had a fatal weakness that it couldn't encrypt a letter as itself. Now that as a matter of engineering fact is true. They knew about it. They didn't try and change it because it struck them as quite good to know that no Pack, patch of, of plain German could appear in the encrypted message. And anyway, it made the wiring a lot easier. Now, the one point at which that so-called weakness is useful is that if you look back in, at the SNMKG intercept, no letter is the same in it as the original crypt. And, and that's a useful way of making sure, oh, thanks, um, th th no, uh, take my word for it, no, none of those letters match. And that's quite a useful way of making sure that your uh, crib and your intercept of the crib are in the same positions as you go along. Okay, so that's, we've got that. Um, now, again, if you'd move to the next slide, I'll show you what we do, what, what we do with that. Now, this slide is getting, a, it's going to get worse as we go on, but bear with me. What you've got there, across the top, you've got the intercept message we know and love. Um, you've got the intercept written out again we've highlighted in yellow the pairs that we've used and if you look at what's been drawn underneath you'll notice that five letters in at zze the letter g encrypts as e then at zzp e encrypts as v then zzg v encrypts as s back across s at zzm s encrypts as a then a encrypts at ZZN to give you R. Then in two different places, ZZF and ZZL, you'll notice that um, R encrypts as G. Now the key thing here is that 
um, that's a closed loop. If you see, imagine that you had one, two, three, four, five, six enigmas joined together. So the output of the first goes to the input of the second, and they're all offset to represent relative to this imaginary ZZZ, their positions in the message. If you did that, and if, there's a lot of ifs here, bear with me, if the enigma was set to the right key of the day in the start position, then when you got that far through the message, the letter G would be typed in and it would come back as itself. Now, you need to start thinking differently here. Um, Turing was rather good at this. It's not, I, what I said was true, G would come back as itself. But another way of putting that is this, if G doesn't come back as itself, then you know it is not the answer. If G does come back as itself, it doesn't prove it is, but if it doesn't, it proves it isn't. You, it sometimes helps if you stand on your head at this point. Okay, so um, that loop then is what is going to, the bomb is going to be told to look for. Uh, ignore the other bits for the moment. They will come in quite handy later, but for the moment it's that loop that we're concentrating on. So in effect, by describing those enigmas set to the right offsets and joined head to tail like that, I have described what Turing then built as the bomb. Because if you had a machine that had those enigmas, you could join them together in the right order and persuade it to notice when a letter came back as itself, then that is exactly what this machine behind me, perhaps we could switch back to that. That's what this is here. Okay, now, um, I, let, uh, one more detail about this thing. I said it's a perfect replica. This is the only working bomb in existence. It's a sufficiently good replica that if any, they ever found one of the original ones, they were all destroyed after the war, um, then the bits from it would fit in this and vice versa. GCHQ supplied John Harper, the project manager, with the original blueprints, literally, of the thing. And this is what a team has built over a lot of years. It, it is completely perfect and accurate in the sense it passes all the factors acceptance tests. We have also recreated, and this, you, again, I'm sure all of you will appreciate this, the entire code breaking process, all the way from the intercept through to the key of the day, to the point that we regularly run challenges with GCHQ and others, that, that, that where they give us a crib and uh, with, without obviously the key of the day. And we take that crib and using this machine and nothing else, we break the key. We've done that, I think, oh, something like 16 times altogether with different places. One in Germany, God help us, one in Poland who started it all. And basically our score is 16 out of 16. It's quite tense and quite stressful doing that. And I make that point because you never know, some of you may get involved with doing that sometime. But this machine is, as the, I repeat, the only place in the world that that can be done. So what is it? What you've got, let me just go around the other side. You've got here, these three, can you see that? Yes, these three drums represent a, the three rotors of an enigma. And you've got a total of 36 positions you can put drums in and, um, they are set to match the uh, menu that we drew on the screen. So this one is ZZB, ZZP, ZZG, ZZM. You'll recognize all these offsets from that last screen. Now there's, the, the machine can run three different menus at the same time. And the reason you need to do that is this. We all learned about combination theory in the same place and um, if you've got five drums and you take three of them, discarding two, then that's five shriek over two shriek possibilities, 60. Okay, now um, if we, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, could we go back to the uh, settings page, please? It's perfect. Now, uh, photograph that, that in your heads because the left-hand side column, the wheel order, has got a gorgeous howler in it, or series of howlers. If you, um, the engineers were responsible for putting that together month by month, and the code breakers got caught out because the engineers said, look, if you've got these wheels 
in the um, in the machine, it's not a bad idea to swap them around from time to time to make sure the contacts stay clean and so on. And they put together two or three rules, one of which that says that you must change at least one wheel every day and that no wheel must be in the same place two days running. All of which, I mean, you know, we, I hope some of us are engineers. At first sight, you think, yeah, that's quite reasonable. We all know about dirty contacts, but it's a disaster from the code breaking point of view. Because suddenly, instead of having the 60 the wheel orders to work out, you can, the number of wheel orders you need to check is actually much smaller than that. Now, I'm not going to tell you the answer um, because you, know, you never know. You might like to work it out for yourselves, but it's substantially less than that. And it substantially reduces the number of menus you have to run, the number of wheel orders you have to test. Um, a classic. There are lots of mistakes in this story. You'll see more of them later. But that's an absolutely classic code breaking mistake. You must not take randomness out of the, the word. If that, it is entirely reasonable to have the same three wheel orders in the same three wheels in the same place day after day, but you know it, it grates with the engineers. Now let me just cover one more thing while we've got uh, before we actually run the machine. This thing here. Um, can can you? Yes, we can see that. Super. This is one of the rotors from our own Enigma. Okay, and you notice it's got the numbers around the edge. You can, I can't do this with one hand. Um, I'm, so I'll just put the microphone down. So if you, you can turn this wheel and it changes the relationship between the letters on the, or the numbers here and the wiring inside the scrambler. So it's going to go quiet, but bear with me. So I'm not sure how well that comes across, but um, don't worry too much. Notice that there is a notch in the outside ring of the thing as well. It's, let me get it by my finger, because that's the point at which the, there it, okay, that's the point at which the, this wheel turns over the middle wheel and so on. And turnovers are going to feature, I'm afraid, rather prominently in the thing later. Anyway, look, this is, so this is one of my five wheels of which we've chosen one. This is the bomb's equivalent. If I take one of these drums off, what you have here is, super, thanks. Okay. Um, th this is wired to match one of those five rotors, and you can see. I'll turn if there we go. Yeah, those little brushes there make contact with the um, studs on the commutator underneath it. I'm going to put the drum back because I'm supposed to. There we go. That's back to ZZZ. Okay, um, and as the drum spins, then those brushes move over the pads on the computator and um, in effect are the same, the equivalent of moving the keys on, on an Enigma. The, the point is though that all the 12 Enigmas in this menu or the 12 in the same menu with a different wheel order all stay in sync. So that the spacing that you deduce from the menus is maintained. Now, okay, I think probably the next thing to do is actually run the bomb and see what happens. Okay, so um, it gets a little bit noisy when I do that. I'm basically going to set it off and it will run looking for um, the, uh, the test that I described where a letter comes back as itself. Again, the way the bomb is working is this. If it finds a letter that comes back as itself, what you then get is called a stop because the bomb then stops. But if it doesn't stop, in other words, if it keeps spinning, that means that it has rejected that particular wheel position as a possible answer. It's only when it stops, it says, look, guys, I can't reject this one. It's possibly the answer. It's possibly just a fluke. As it runs, these black disks on the end here act like a counter and tell you how far you have moved from the, this imaginary ZZZ, which they all start at. Okay, there we go. Right, so I'm going to run it now. With luck, it will stop once and then I will show you what's happening. I'll then restart it, look for another stop, 
and then leave it running while we peer inside in more detail. Because ignoring the cryptography for a moment, the engineering of this thing is also beautiful. Right, here we go. Right. Now that's running happily. You see here, each time that drum spins, it has rejected 60, uh, excuse me, sorry, 26 failed solutions. So let it keep running. Th th when this goes round, that moves, and that one moves. Excellent. Right, now that's a stop. Um, notice, don't bother writing this down, but notice it stopped at SNY. That's a measure to base 26 of how far it's moved from ZZZ. Any of you who have 26 fingers and toes are in good shape at this point. It's popped up one other thing here. Uh, this is almost impossible to see, but it's told you, oh, well done. It's told you that the letter that goes all the way around the loop is D. Now, I hear you cry, why isn't that G? Because that's where it's fed in. I shall answer that question, but not yet. Because what I'm going to do now is restart it. Off it goes again. And that's exactly what they would do. The wrens who are running these things would write down the stop and the stop letter, start it again, and off it goes. Super, it's working perfectly. I did say it would. That's DKX, and the stop letter is Q. Make a note of that again, because we're going to hear more of it later. Now, those, it, this menu would actually stop four times. Um, it's the first two that we're interested in for future use. Those are the two stops we've got. I'm now going to run it, let it run while we wander around the back and have a look inside it. Here we go. Right, now first of all, um, this panel here is where the menu is plugged and connected to, to join the enigmas together. What you have is a series of 26-way cables which are joining the enigmas together in accordance with the menu. Think of a series of elephants in a circus, trunk to tail and so on. So, and here we have two identical menus, as you'd expect, because we're running two wheel orders. That's the third one which we haven't used. So if we now have a look inside the thing, this is a bit lethal, bear with me. Because the first thing to notice is the big motor here. Now, that's running the whole thing. It's a DC motor, because in those days, the local mains was indeed 200 volts DC. Now, when I, in 1957, when I went uh, to, to Horsham, they had only just not uh, changed away from having some buildings powered with DC and others with AC, which looking back was just terrifying. How they didn't have more accidents, I shall never know. So this, this one is running correctly on 200 volts DC, and we've had to make our own version of that locally. Okay, now let's have a look around the rest of it here. Um, first of all, th here, you can see the carry mechanism, which is moving the middle drums. And you can see here, That cam is counting the, the, the turns on the middle bank. 
that the, these are all the timing cams. The whole machine is run by over here. by a series of relays. No, this one's my favorite. Notice that's ticking away in time with the carriers. There, there, there are no, this is purely electromechanical. It, there are no uh, valves or anything in it. Okay, now, um, one, let me just digress for a minute while we're here, because the one thing this machine is not is a computer. I know this is in the National Museum of Computing, I, but this thing, it may be an ancestor of the computers. Colossus next door is or was a computer. This thing isn't. It's a special purpose, a hugely parallel machine, as we've gathered, okay, designed for just this. Now, it does this rather well. If in the first time I got involved with the thing, um, it, this takes about 11 or 12 minutes to go through this whole menu. If you try to do the same thing with a good desktop in the late, well, towards the end of last century, it didn't take 10 minutes. It took anything from 10 hours to 10 days. And the reason for that is visible to you up at the top there, those huge coils of wire. There's something like 10 or 11 miles of wire in this thing because all of the enigmas are connected in parallel you know, with the 26-way cables we've seen. Now, if you look at the speed of this thing, you see this spinning arm here. That is used uh, uh, to control the timing of the thing. But that arm is going around at the same speed as the drums. And you see how the brushes are moving over the studs, as we said, around the front. Roughly speaking, it's got about 25 milliseconds for each stud. And of that 25 milliseconds, maybe the 10 milliseconds in the middle is useful to us because that's when the brushes are settled on the stud. These relays back over here, have the, the, these are the very high speed relays. They have therefore got less than 10 milliseconds, <coughs> less than 10 milliseconds to make the decision. Oh good, isn't that convenient? So they've got less than 10 milliseconds to make the decision based on the uh, signals going through all of those miles of wire and coming back. I'll, I'll shut the power off now, because I think we've seen all we needed to there. It is a, ne never mind code breaking for the moment, um, people. We all were brought up in an engineering environment, um, and um, you know this is a wonderful piece of engineering. I ended up as a television engineer, and once when we started commissioning this thing back in 2010, um, I kept stumbling across areas that this thing would have infringed stuff that I knew was patented maybe, you know, the 1970s, 1980s. They, would, they didn't bother patenting anything, but you know, th there wasn't time, and the engineers don't normally, but they were just wonderfully good engineers as well as wonderfully good code breakers. And I want to stress that because um, th th you'll see why later. Anyway, look, this is the back of the thing, um, you know, we, fully exposed. I repeat, there were over 200 of them built because there were something like 30 networks to deal with, e um, each of which had a different key of the day every day. Think of a factory, basically. They got the intercepts early, you know, 12. The key changed at midday every day, midnight, excuse me. Um, and they were getting fairly pissed off, as they told us. If come three in the morning, they hadn't broken the key of the day. We can only just, hopping back to what I said about GCHQ, we can re, uh, break three hours, but at the end of it, you've had enough. And they just kept doing it day after day. And you've sort of seen already, I think, that the people operating these things didn't, that you didn't sort of get any feedback. You never got to decode a message. All you did was get a stop and pass it on to the next stage, which we'll have a look at next. I, um, as it happens, my aunt was one of the men's working here. She's been back, obviously, seeing this thing. Um, and she, she makes the point, we know more than they ever did. She never heard the word enigma during the war. They were told once, she says, oh, well done, team. You sank the, the Bismarck last, last night. But that was all they ever got. OK, so look, back. let's head out back now, out here. I lost my um, instructions, bear with me. Look, 
Right, here we go. Now, um, the question is, we've got those two stops. Call up that slide if you, thank you. Um, SNYGD and DKXGQ. You've seen it do that, so you might even believe me. Now the question is, what did you do with that? And the answer is this slightly, compared to the bomb, slightly dull looking machine over here. But um, if you call that up for a moment, please, <clears throat> please, John. Thank you. It's called the checking machine, because what does it do? It checks stops to decide whether the stop is a fluke or possibly the key of the day. Um, I focus on this because I love it, and it's the one that tends to show you how the, um, the bomb itself works. So um, I'll just play a quick video of it, please, if you would, because we found the hard way. If you sit in front of it, nobody can see what's happening. <clears throat> so here we go. It's, this is the same one. Right. I'm, what we're doing here is feeding in you see, the, 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 the stop we want to analyze. You see here, no, point, no use pointing at that, D has gone to, there's D, there's K, and there's X. So we have offset those drums to match the DKX stop that we're looking at. So now we set the first link on that loop, which was at ZZE. You type, now when you type in the stop letter, which was Q, T pops up. So let, let, I'm going to let this, I, I want you to worry while this is going on, why did I type in um, whatever it was, Q, not G, and why did I get back T, not E, and why at ZZG here, did I, when I typed in N, did I, did I get back S, and so on. <clears throat> so let, let this finish, and the answer now is, you remember I hinted darkly 20 minutes ago that the steckers were actually not making it more difficult, they actually helped. Because the answer is, when we get, let's call up the next slide again now. I think we've seen, yep, we've done, we've used that video enough. Right, now, um, holding that slide, um, when I typed in, in, in the input, when I typed in Q, at ZZE there, I got the letter T back again. Now concentrate, especially you, Roger, because this is difficult. The point is this, if this is the right stop, okay, then if Q is the stecker partner of G, and it's Q that's come back around the loop, then all the other letters that you get around that loop in those empty boxes are also the stecker partners of those relevant letters. So if this is the right stop, Okay, then um, Q is the partner of G, T is the partner of E that we saw come up there. And by the time we've been all the way around that loop and we've come back to G, we have got all the stecker partners of all of the letters in, in that stop. So I, I think probably the next slide will help us now. Let's have a look. Yep, next slide, please. Next slide, if you'd please, John. Sorry, my fault. I was fumbling with the notes. What? Oh, okay. No, not to worry. I'll fake it. Um, what if 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 you would move the camera, point at one of those? Okay. Um, the bottom left one there is a a stop. Not in fact the one we're examining, but that's okay. Um, we put in K. All right, at, and then at ZZE, that came out as C, that went round to V, round to D, round to M, back to R, and then back to K. So that is a perfectly legitimate place for the bomb to have stopped. But um, that this, the, the stickers here are fatally wrong. Okay, if you look at, um, right, follow that link across from E to ZZK across to U, and it said, oh, okay, the stecker partner of U is M. That's super. Why you can't hear you? Can you keep talking without picture? Um, yes, give me, just let me swing the trap on this one and I'll be with you. Okay, so, um, right. So if you look at M to U, um, but we, M is paired with U, but in the bottom left-hand corner, it's tried to pair M 
with A, all right? Now that's not fair because a letter can't be paired with more than one letter. So this stop is legitimate, but invalid. It's a fluke. False positive is the word we use these days. Now I love this bit because it demonstrates how the stickers have become part of the solution not part of the problem. It's all a bit Shakespearean here. Their master headline is, the king hath note of all that they intend by interceptions that they dream not of, which is an entirely reasonable attitude. But um, the slogan we like for this is, out of this nettle danger, we pluck this flower safety, because the steckers have stopped being part of the problem and have become part of the solution. Okay, we want to, yeah, okay. Yeah, we, there's going to be a slight pause now while we try and get the show back on the road. Don't you just love live television? Right, now punch up the side if you can. Okay. Then what we'll do is point the camera at this, my, my notes in my hand here. I'll, I tell you, if I put it here, it will stay still. Does that work better? Uh, uh, if you can get both, I'd be grateful. If not, the top won't write. Now, this, this is the next page of my notes. Huh? Um, and you'll notice that what we're doing here is looking at two stops, the ones we got, SNY, with the letter D and DKX with the letter Q. And we filled in these boxes here with the answers so that the, the video we saw, we typed Q, we got T, we typed T and we got N all the way around the loop and so on. Okay, um, but if we look at this other one, SNY for a moment. Okay, you'll notice that this is an invalid stop. It fails because X to A and X to Z it again means it, it, the loop is closed, but it's an invalid stop, not a the valid stop. So at this point, we know that DKX is the valid stop, as it were. And we know most of the steckers, okay? Um, because um, we've got all the loop. We've also got these other branches. And you're probably sat in agony wondering what the hell they're for, because they're not part of the loop. What are they doing? And they're doing two things. Firstly, of course, they're getting extra stickers and making the test more difficult. Um, the valid stop thingy, okay? But secondly, um, they, they, this is where the Welchman is added to the original Turing bomb, because I'm going to briefly talk about the thing called the diagonal board. Now, you've probably heard of that, says he, but this shows it in operation because there would be no point in having all these extra links here if on, on the original Turing design, but to put it in its simplest terms, what the diagonal board does is make an effect phantom loops out of the other letters. If you look at this top one now, we haven't filled in that square, which is highly significant, because in fact, if you set up that extra enigma, which is not in this menu, okay, you get the letter X as its partner. Now, what the diagonal board does is this. If on the letter W in the diagonal board, X is set, then, then on the letter um, Z, X, sorry, Z, I should have said, not X, Z is set, then on the letter Z, X is set. And the effect of that is that that makes another loop. And if you put in that 13th enigma, the machine would have skipped that stop. It would not have happened. So that, and it was the diagonal board that, I don't want to belittle what Turing did, but, and his machine worked perfectly, but it was the, addition of Welchman's diagonal board that made the difference between success and failure in throughput terms, because a pure Turing bomb would find all the stops, but a lot more of them, and it would need a much more robust key. And in practice, it would have not have delivered the throughput that they need. Right, now we still seem to be short of the still, so I'm gonna do this by hand. Um, can you see the top of those? 
That's perfect. Okay, what we have now done is back with the checking machine. We have been. We can now go through the rest of the. Let's just decode the rest of the intercept because we've got. We we know what the stickers are from Veta Hair for Zaga. By applying those, we can now decode the rest of it. The DMCX. This is like a a um, optician's test, isn't it? Um, Okay, and what you get is Biskaya, then an X for the word spacing, then uh, Schwerer, heavy, Sturm, Sturm, storms, excuse me, in Scotland. And of course, that's what the um, weather forecast was that evening in the middle of, from the middle of the Bay of Biscay. So um, let's now pause because, um, again, we, I assume we haven't got our still back. Okay, all right, that's right. Um, I can um, talk through, talk over the next bit, it's easy. The problem we've now got is this, that the, um, we have decoded the whole of that crib message, whoopee, but that's only part of the problem because the, um, um, we, what we can't now do is decode a, the other messages. We haven't got the whole of the key of the day yet. Do you remember when I was waving that rotor around back in the machine, I was talking about the ring settings. We haven't got those yet. All we know is that relative to ZZZ, we have the stop as a sort of relative ring setting. And there's another particularly tedious um, piece of work, which was called clonking, which is, you need to go through to get the ring settings and the rest of the key of the day. And I'm not going to demonstrate that, partly because no human being can understand it. Um, it's something that was never written down because you've seen already that, that when you get an invalid stop, it's rejected very quickly by the men working the checking machine. Only the good stop, the valid stop, is passed back here, because all the bombs were at outstations, is passed back here for the code breakers to analyze. And there weren't very many of those. Now, we've talked to one lady who used to do this, a very remarkable lady. Um, and... You know, she, she used to, it, her mission was to take a good stop and get the key of the day. She didn't, did nothing else throughout the war. So she was working all night, obviously, every night, living off dodgy food. By the end of the war, her name was Marjorie Pattle, I should say. Um, not one of ours, I'm sorry to say, but um, there you go. Um, by the end of the war, she'd been living on whale meat all night. Her digestion had packed up. Then she got TB, then she got over both of those, and she went back to Oxford, I think it was, finished her classics degree as though nothing had happened. That's the sort of people who were, who were working here. If there was a miracle of Bletchley Park, it was that such a diverse collection of people were put together and made, got to work in, together with their appropriate skills. So um, what I think I'm going to do now is this. It's nearly time to ask for questions. Um, I'm, I don't want anyone to relax. If anyone's still awake, um, I'm going to ask Gina to send round a cup. A, we've got another message with the same key of the day, um, but different message headers. And I'm going to send that round and invite anybody to... Uh, who can to decode it. Now again, sorry, to, to, for the non-CH people, I apologize, but remember all of our exams, you were told, don't just give the answer, show you're working. That's exactly right, because I, um, anyone who can solve it should not just say that's the answer, but the, um, explain how they got there, please. Okay, now look, I think it's, yeah, we're sort of out of time. Let's um, hand back to Gina, see if she has any questions for anybody. Sorry, I'm just getting my, uh, there, oh, we go. Sorry. Right. there we go. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, please do type any more into the Q&A box um, as we go. <clears throat> and let's see. Uh, this one, it, I hope you understand it because it means nothing to me. Um, so Adam has asked, when you mention shriek, is that the same meaning as factorial? Oh, it is. Yes. Oh, dear. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. Um, that, but I, we were taught um, sh shriek as the description of those. Okay. Um, he must have, I, I deduced from that, he's either older or younger than me. <laughs> no, you're okay. quite right. So, yes, it's, that's, um, it's basically it t t taking three from five is five factorial over two factorial. And that that's comes out at 60. 
Excellent. Hey, we've um, got one question we could answer. Well done. <laughs> Um, so from uh, from Colin, in building the replica, were there any parts in particular that were particularly, two particulars there, that were difficult to source or produce? Yes, good question, thank you. Um, first of all, um, let me, I'll just take a, a drum off if I may to show you that. Whoa. Um, does that show up all right? Yeah, you see the, the, the 26 uh, sets of four brushes, each of those is held in a little black plastic molding. In the, oh, that shows it well, thank you. In the originals, those um, uh, black bits were actually a Bakelite molding. Now, Bakelite is not easy to mold uh, by a bunch of amateurs, if you will. So we made a mold and used a um, plastic injection molder, which we happen to have to make those. That was one example. But while the drum is off, can you get back to this? Um, careful. Right. Back here. Yeah. Th th these commutators were a nightmare to make. Because um, you need, as you see, quite a lot of them. And they were cast in the right sort of resin, um, having previously held the studs in the right alignment. Yeah, a lot of those were needed and that was very tedious. It's a nightmare worry to us. I'm glad you asked the question. Please repeat after me, I volunteer, because sadly the two members, lead members of that team have since died and I don't know what we're going to do if we ever need any more of them. So I mean, there were lots of other difficult bits. I didn't mean those happened to be the ones I personally ran across. Okay. Okay. Is that it? Have um, you shut them all up? <laughs> And from, uh, from the same person, when four rotor enigmas were introduced, what modifications, if any, had to be made to the bomb design? But that's a, that's a, another very good question. Um, a, a lot is the short answer because, of course, it would have to, at first sight, it would have to go 26 times as fast to get through the, instead of 26 cubed possibilities, you've got 26 to the fourth, which I can't do in my head. Um, and there were two or three different ways of doing that. There was a machine called High Speed Keen, which did it. And another one, I'm not an expert on this, another one called Cobra. They managed it. Fortunately, that's a better question than you meant it to be, Colin. Thank you. Because um, we knew what the wiring of the extra rotors were because they, they, they made an absolutely classic mistake. Okay. Um, they, it was Dernitz who didn't understand why the boats were turning up and sinking his U-boats to, rather too often. And so he demanded a four-wheel enigma for the U-boats. But what they did, bless them, was send the same messages in th this, with the same key of the day in three-wheel for the surface ships and four-wheel for the enigmas. And seconds after that, of course, you've got the wiring of the, uh, the four-wheel enigmas. That was, it was only, I think, the naval uh, enigmas that needed the four-wheel bomb, but obviously we all know the importance of that. Okay, um, here's a nice one to read out. Why was it called a bomb? Yeah, that's a, a, a great. Don't you love it when the audience is, is paying attention? Um, thanks, team. It's, it's slightly lost in the mists of time. The Poles started it, you remember? I said that. Um, they, the, the technique they used was based on the message headers, okay? And at that time, the Germans were sending the message header twice, which is the other absolute thou shalt not co-breaking mistake. Okay. Um, and the Poles knew because they decoded the German messages saying so that when the war started, they were going to go back to just a single thing and Turing a single uh, message header. Um, and Turing knew that. But in the meantime, the Poles had built um, a, a, a early version of the machine. Um, they called theirs a bomba. Now we don't know why um, we're, we're in touch with the poles. They don't know. That one possibility is it made a noise. Um, another one was that they had the idea when they were having a, a, an ice cream dessert. We don't know. What we do know as a fact is that the people here who love playing word games um, called their machine bomb in honor of the work that the poles had done. Because the poles did more than 
it wasn't just that they solved it, they forced, I think is not too strong a word, the people here to face that it was possible and therefore essential to break the thing. In the same way that when um, somebody ran the mile in four minutes, the same year, lots of other people did the same argument. So I'm sorry, the answer is we don't know. That's our, that is our considered best guess. Okay. Uh, so from Gordon, were there maintenance engineers on hand during the war to keep all the electromechanical equipment in top condition? Yes, absolutely. Um, they, they, you, you saw me wearing a, in your header photo, uh, Gina, I've been wearing a brown uh, lab coat. That's what they wore. I was in engineer mode that day. Um, they were on standby. They had test rack, test gear, and so on. They would wheel up because I, um, again, you prompted me. What happens, I hear you cry, if when you're analyzing a stop, the loop doesn't close? It's not valid or invalid, it's a wrong stop. And that, at that point, you call the maintenance crew because either you've plugged it wrong or the bomb is not working properly. So yes, there were maintenance shifts. I think they were RAF um, based on, on duty all the time, but the things were unbelievably reliable. It, I, I wax lyrical about the speed, but it's actually running well within itself. It's a super piece of engineering. Also, it has built in a huge amount of redundancy. If one of the, um, it's got not three, but four banks of the very fast relays. If one of them packs up, you can just switch to another one. If an Enigma packs up, you can re-plumb it to use a different one. It was a, I repeat, sorry, it was a superb piece of engineering as well as a superb piece of code breaking. Okay, um, so from David, could a 3D printer be used to produce replacement uh, commutators? Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. I've, I'm, I, I do a lot of 3D printing work myself. I think that it would be difficult it might be possible, yes. The, the difficulty is that you've got to have the metal bits aligned in it. So yes, it probably could. It's got to be quite flat, remember? Um, and it would, that's, we might well try that. Let's just hope we never have to do that. We've got about two spares left. However, I mean, one, let me jump to the commercial at the end, if I may. One of the reasons I'm, I'm doing this today, obviously I love the school and what it taught me, but, um, and I owe it, but we actually need help. Um, we're all not as young as we were, and we would love to recruit demonstrators and or engineers to help look after the thing. Um, you know, come, come and see us is the, is the answer. So, um, uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name who suggested 3D printing. Be, be, be warned if you do. Um, we have a very generous concept of the word a volunteer. Okay. Uh, and this one about you. Is this a project you took on after retiring from your day job? Yes, that's you sort of. Um, th that the my day job, I was the research director of this company called Quantel, who was hugely successful. The problem was that um, I got promoted way above my ability and wasn't able to do what I called engineering anymore. I was supposed to sit in an office and manage, and I can't do that, as we all know. Um, and um, so what was happening was that the company got sucked into supporting it because of the speed issues I was telling you about. Because at that time, people were saying, oh, you shouldn't build special purpose hardware. You should do it all with a computer. And the timings of this thing in the 1990s was just a PR gift to us. Even um, Roger Thornton, our PR manager, couldn't make a hash of that. Um, but um, I therefore started setting up an, a workshop of my own at home where I was making bits in parallel with my day job. I then cleverly retired at about the time we were commissioning this thing, which is what I actually love doing, standing next to the, the machine like this. And again, anyone who sympathizes with the sentence should be working here, please. Um, that it was just wonderful, basically. Okay. Um, so the question is, how big a problem would it have been to use the bomb to crack messages from the British? I think um, there was a, a spelling amendment, but it's disappeared from my screen. I think it's British Typex machine. Uh, yes, no, that, that's Typex was a, um, uh, yeah, Typex was the British equivalent. Do you want to fix the picture of it, John? I'll hold it up for a second. I think it's in the back. Um, Typex was a rotor-based machine um, can you get, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, can you get any of that at all? Okay, it had um, five rotors, okay, and it was used by 
um, you know, us over here. Um, indeed, when the decoded messages were sent back out to a small number of people out there, you know, like 30 something, to, uh, to, to use the intelligence, um, they were re-encrypted on a Typex before you do that. I think with five wheels, it would have been difficult. The story goes, and don't, I can't prove this, but that doesn't handicap me at all, that the Germans captured a Typex at Dunkirk, but the, um, what the, the, uh, the, the signals people there had done was take out the wheels and stamp them into the sand so they were never found. And the Germans, so the story goes, took one look at it and said, oh, we know our three-wheel machine is perfect, therefore we're not even going to try the five-wheel machine. That's a bit anecdotal, that one. Don't, don't take it to the bank. Okay, uh, so Ken says, has the centre made a bomb using present-day technology? Um, Yes-ish. Um, we There are various software simulations of the thing, okay? Um, and um, the, 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 I haven't seen a hardware modern equivalent because you sort of wouldn't bother, which I think is a pity. So yes, it can be done in software. And these days, a, um, a software emulator can indeed keep up with a real one. Okay, which is great, except that's actually 70 years too late. Okay, at the time, well, you know, it wouldn't have helped. So yes, it can be done. Um, and uh, were there any old, well, that you know of, were there any old blue boys or girls who played a significant role at Bletchley? Not that I know of, I'm sorry, um, that you've just uh, invented a research project, though. Um, if anyone would like to, because there is a role of honour, of the names of everybody who worked here, if any, I'm sure, which is publicly available. If any of any of our listeners would like to do that, we'd all love to know. Okay, there it's, we go. There's it, a project. It, sorry. That's if there's a project for someone. Absol absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, I think you probably know this chap. So Roger Thornton says, yeah. "Who did the engineering work on the bomb, and did he learn his skills in the manual school or Vincent Smith's lab?" Um, both, I think. Yes, I do know Roger Thornton. He was Quantel's head of publicity. He, he was famously did for um, Quantel what King Herod did for Mother Care. Um, and um, the answer is yes. Not the skills were learned there, but more than that, I would say, an understanding, and I, I hope some of our guests nod at this time, um, an understanding and love for engineering and the sort of ideas built into the thing. Okay, and we have had a few uh, a few questions around the same thing, which is who who rebuilt uh, this bomb? This uh, much. Quite a lot to do with that as well, didn't you? Yeah, I, I did, but um, it was started by uh, before my before I was involved by a chappy called John Harper, who put the team together. He was the one who got the drawings out of um, GCHQ, and at time sometimes, for example, he had sixty people um, involved in wiring up those twenty six way cables I showed you. Okay, um, he, he, these days there is a team of engineers and de demonstrators who've taken over from that, but it was all done by volunteers, um, it was all done by scrounging and blackmail, um, we never had um, any proper support or funding for it. So it's, it's a wonderful, um, if I may say so, a wonderful example of British engineering, how it was done for the love of it. Lovely. Okay, and I think uh, we're almost on time, so I shall leave it there. Um, we will send a follow-up email around to everyone. Uh, okay. Include the slides and the little test uh, that was mentioned right. Paul earlier. Yep. I can tell you that the uh, National Museum of Computing will be opening. We think it's the week after Bletchley Park opens, so around the 28th of May. I will put that information on as well. Um, and uh, all there is just to say thank you very much, Paul, for your time, uh, give, for the guys. Give, sorry, excuse me interrupting, Gina. Give me one more thing. A couple of slides that got dropped off the end of the presentation will be in your uh, pack. One of them is another message with the same key of the day, okay? Um, and the challenge is, so you know the key of the day, but it's a different message header, so you've got to figure out how to deal with that, okay? Um, and the, the, the credit slide at the end. Um, I will make, I, I mentioned mistakes. One of the, um, the, the, the message header in its two halves was basically you would set the, it has to be different for each message. 
you'll understand that because otherwise, if they're all sent with the same start position for the wheels, you simply act, do a frequency analysis on the first and second letters and so on. It's all trivial. But if you, um, so you needed to, the sender for each message had to think of a different random set of words, which is quite a difficult thing to do. Um, and quite often they would make a, a, a classic mistake where you would, um, Berlin was a favorite, B-E-R space L-I-N. Um, and we use Turing as another one. And I've deliberately made the same mistake in, your, in the test message. You'll all see that and I hope smile, okay? Um, because what you do is take the first half of that, um, the, the B-E-R -E as in Berlin, set the rotors to that, type in L-I-N, you get three more letters, which you then set the wheels to and encrypt the message and you send the encrypted message header. So, um, and that should be enough information for all of you out there if you want to, to decode the thing. Thanks ever so much. You know, um, right. if I apologize to anyone who doesn't understand some of the cross hospital jokes. Too bad is all I can say. The rest of us do. <laughs> okay. No problem. Uh, thank you so much for your time. So much for showing us around. Um, thank you to everyone else who has joined us today or who's joined any of the talks over the last six weeks. Uh, we do hope to be running some more later on in the year. Uh, we will keep you informed. Uh, so thank you everyone and we'll see you soon. Bye.